be? That's right, somewhere else. But I'm glad that you're here. A couple of announcements I want to make. If you're a trustee, there's going to be a trustee meeting Tuesday, 6.30 here at the church. You backsliders, you. You never sit back there. I know. Hey, that's okay, though. That's all right. You've been seeing some pictures, if you've been here this morning for any length of time, of J.P. Braga's ministry there in the Philippines. He sends me a text about every day about how things are going, but he talked about two things that I wanted to bring to your attention. Number one, that little tricycle you see, he says, normally holds 10 people. A little motorcycle with a sidecar. <clears throat> they call it a tricycle. That's a lot of people to get in that on that bike, they're hanging everywhere. And so um, it's not quite like what we have at home, is it? A little bit different. He also said, he always tells me, people get saved pretty frequently in his ministry. They had 10 people saved this morning, which was about, they're 13 hours ahead of us. So it's already happened there. So uh, that's exciting to see that too. He asked us to pray for his finances because uh, he hasn't been home in a while. Several churches don't support unless they see him come home pretty frequently. but. You know, his church is just several poles in the ground with some metal sheets on top, and uh, that's his church. And you can see the photos there. And if you'd like to get his uh, pictures to you on Messenger, just let me know, and we'll make sure that uh, he gets your address and you can do that. But I would just ask you to pray for JP. Uh, he's a young fellow doing a great job for the Lord uh, with not a whole lot to do it with. His one son needs some uh, dental work, and he sent some pictures of his son having some dental work. And... Uh, you don't always think about having dental work in the Philippines, but I guess they're not a whole lot of different than we are in different areas. So anyway, be praying for JP and his group and also for his finances. And just the Lord would continue to bless his ministry. I know they're building a church. They'd like to get it in. We've sent some money down there about several months ago to help with the electricity to help get that into the church. And so God's good. Amen. Also, not just a trustee meeting on Tuesday, but tonight at 5 o'clock, there's going to be a missions committee meeting. And so if you're on the missions committee, come on out for that. Uh, 5 o'clock, I think, is when we have that scheduled. And so make sure that you're there for that. And I can't think of anything else I'd like to talk about. I get to talk later on all the time. Isn't that wonderful? What a blessing I have. You guys have to sit there and listen. Oh, hallelujah. God's good. Amen? God's good. Amen? Did I say God was good? Amen. That's right. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much for all that you've given to us. We thank you for the opportunity today to be here. We thank you for the joy and the pleasure it is for us to worship you and to, to just acknowledge what you've done in our lives, how, how important you are to us, the hope that we have each day, the joy that we feel each day, the happiness that we have, all because of your son coming into the world and dying in our place upon that cross and through that sacrifice and through our faith and repentance, we can have eternal life with you. We can begin to know you for the first time in our lives. And God, we just thank you so much that you loved us that much, that you would send your son into the world to die for us. How can we ever understand the, the depths of that love? And so, Lord, we just praise you today. We ask you to fill our hearts with worship this morning, fill our hearts with joy. Help us to come into your presence with thanksgiving. Lord, we just love you today, and we thank you for all the blessings that you've given to us. We thank you for our families. We thank you for our church building. We thank you for our church people. We thank you for these that are watching at home who can't come yet. And so, Lord, we just thank you for your goodness because it's good. And we pray, Father God, that this COVID-19 virus might soon dissipate and go away. We pray, Father God, that our church might come back to just normal, whatever that is now. But, Lord, we just pray that maybe through this that you've shown us some things that we need to be concerned about, how life couldn't be shorter than we imagine it to be. And we just thank you, God, just for your presence in our life each day. So, Lord, have your way in our lives this morning. Fill us with your goodness. Fill us with your spirit. Let us soar with the eagles as we remember who you are, and let us give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Guys, you ready?
is Ephesians 3, verse 14. It says, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family on earth derives its name, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in the inner man, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth to know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled up to the fullness of God. We're going to stand and sing this morning about the love of God.
God's love is amazing. Thank you for your singing. You may be seated. At this time, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sing a song. Um, and I, I feel like sometimes you, sometimes you, you pick something because it, it, it's what you want. Uh, and, and sometimes you, I feel like God kind of assigns you a, a message to live. And uh, I, don't, I don't know about everybody here, um, but this has not been a particularly great year <laughs> for us. And uh, I, think, I think what God is, is wanting me to, to know right now, what God is wanting me to say back to him, uh, is that he is in control, uh, that he is good, that he loves me, that he's working in me through, through my circumstances, uh, certainly through trials. Uh, that he is he is sovereign uh, this song is called he's sovereign over us there is strength within our sorrows there is beauty in our tears You meet us in our mourning With a love that casts out fear You are working in our waiting You're sanctifying us When beyond our understanding You are teaching us to trust Your plans are still to prosper You have not forgotten us You're with us in the fire and the flood You're faithful forever Perfect in love, you are sovereign over us. You are wisdom unimagined. Who can understand your ways? Reigning high up. grace. You're the lifter of the lowly. Compassionate and kind. You surround and you uphold me. Your promises are my delight. Your plans are still to prosper. You have not forgotten us. You're with us in the fire and the flood. You're faithful forever, perfect in love. You are sovereign over us. And your plans are still to prosper. You have forgotten us you're with us in the fire and the flood you're faithful forever perfect in love you are sovereign over us for evil you turn it for our good you turn it for our good and for your glory even in the valley you are faithful you are working for our good you are working for our good 
and for your glory even what the enemy means for evil you turn it for our good you turn it for our good and for your glory even in the valley you are faithful you are working for our good you are working for our good and for your glory your plans are still to prosper you have not forgotten us you're with us in the fire and the flood and you're faithful forever perfect in love you are sovereign over us and you're faithful forever perfect in love you are sovereign over us I know. I thought I was going to announce that, so I guess not. That's all right. Happy Grandparents' Day. You know, those are grandparents. We have Father's Day. We have Mother's Day. We have Grandparents' Day. Man, we get it every which way. This is great. Now, how many of your kids brought you something? How many of your grandkids brought you something, grandparents? This is your day. Maybe we need to make a bigger thing out of this Grandparents' Day. What do you think? Huh? Yeah? <laughs> Hey, let me make a couple announcements that I forgot. John, I'm sorry I forgot to mention about the golf tournament for the Beavers Lion Club. That's going to be coming up on the 19th. That's next Saturday. It starts at 1 o'clock. If you'd like to join, it's $50 per person. You can just come up on that day. If you don't have a team, that's okay. They'll find you some place to go to. Uh, usually they need people to fill in some of the teams anyway when people can't come. And so it's $50 per person. Be there around 12 o'clock to sign up. And then the tournament will kick off at 1 o'clock there next Saturday afternoon. Also, the last Wednesday in September. I don't know what day that is. I have the 29th in my mind, but it could be the 30th. Everybody's grabbing for their phones. I love this. Our phone's wonderful, Tom. Where would we be without our little computers? 30th. Thank you, Ken. The 30th of September, we're going to have a special fellowship on Wednesday night at the church. We're going to be showing a movie out here in the parking lot. We're going to have some hot dogs. We'll have a bonfire. We'll have some popcorn. It'll be a good time of fellowship outside, so it's pretty much safe. This, you know, we'll keep our social distancing as we have. And speaking of that, of course, when you come into the church, you should have a mask on. When you leave the church, you should have a mask on. And uh, once you get outside, you're free to do whatever you'd like to do. That's okay. Uh, we just don't want fellowshipping inside the church for obvious reasons. And so I would just ask you to be as careful as you can. We try to be. There's a hand cleaners at all the doors. I just brought, and my neighbor gave me a big can of hand cleaners. said, bring it to the church, let him use it. I don't know if he thinks we're dirty. <laughs> no, but he, just tried, had a, he, he said they'd never use that in a million years. And so be praying that uh, it'll get gone before a million years is over. Uh, but it's, it's out there on the visitor center. So if anybody would like to use that, you're welcome to. Is God good? You know, I look forward to when we get normal. It's been so long. You guys from ABC? Hey, I could tell. Not that that's a bad thing, by the way. 
you just look like ABC kids. Stephen, do they look like ABC kids? Yeah. Uh, there's some ABC people here too, guys, so don't worry about it. We're part of who you were, or no. We were who you are. That, that works better. All right. Open your Bibles as we get started to the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 5. And I want to talk to you just for a few minutes before we talk about other things about what the church is and what our plans are for our church. Matthew chapter 5, and we're going to look at verses 13 down to verse 16. Are you guys still married? Don't know? See, I did their wedding counseling months ahead of time, and then we had months before their wedding, and I was always asking them, are you still getting married? And so now that they are married, I guess I should ask them, are you still married? And she's questioning it. I don't know. You guys need counseling again? No, <laughs> no that's great. Anyway, Matthew chapter 5. Are you all there? Let's read it together. Let's read it out loud together. Can we do that? Let's do that. Verse 13, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Father, we thank you and we praise you so much for the time that you've given to us on this Sunday, this resurrection morning, that we might celebrate the truth that we are part of the church that Jesus died to create. Help us, O oh God, to do his will, to do his bidding, that we might glorify him in all that we do, all that we say, that he might receive the preeminence of our life. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. When we think about the church and what the church is, we have a couple of things to think about. Number one, the church is a building. Most of us think of a church being a building, but a church is much more than a building. A building is just a building. It's just a shell that actually houses the church. And you know this as well as I do, that the church is the people. You are the church where you're sitting at. You are a block that makes up this local body of believers here at Daniel's Missionary Baptist Church. And so when we talk about the church as a whole, we're also talking about the church singular, not just corporately, but singular. We're talking about who we are and what's expected of us as a church. And that speaks of our individuality, what's expected of us as individual people. There's two things these verses teach us, I think, that we need to take note of today, and that is what it is that God expects from us. And there's two, there's two important ministries here that I think God is impressing upon our hearts. Number one is preservation. We are the salt of the earth. That's there for a purpose. And so we have preservation. But we also have Jesus saying that we are the light of the world. You are the light of the world. It's interesting that when Jesus was in the world, he said, I am the light of the world. But Jesus isn't in the world, is he, right now? Has anybody seen him today? Well, that's good. We'd worry about you otherwise. Really, we would. That's the truth. But if you think about it, since Jesus is not in the world, he says it very plainly here, who is the light of the world? Me. Let's just make it more personal. Let's make it more intimate. We're not talking about the church as a whole. The church, of course, is the light of the world, right? We see that in 2 Thessalonians 2. When it talks about the restrainer, speaking of the church, when the restrainer is taken out of the way, the church and the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit lives within the church, when the Holy Spirit is taken out of the way, the church goes with it in the rapture, then the evil can come upon the world, the Antichrist will come. And so we are called to be preservers of righteousness. God has given us commands, God has given us our marching orders, and we have to be faithful in fulfilling the things that God desires from us, Amen. And so we are to be instruments of preservation, instruments of preservation, but not just that, illumination. Illumination. We are the light of the world. We're supposed to shine, shine bright in the darkness of the world that surrounds us. People talk about a dead, 
The world is, is dying. The world is dead. It's dead in its trespasses and sin. Now, we have the opportunity through the gospel of Jesus Christ to be able to go out into the world and preach the gospel that when people hear it, acknowledge it, and yield to it, it brings into their life something that's marvelous. It brings to their life resurrection power. It brings the dead back to life. That's what the gospel does. We have been entrusted with that gospel the good news of Jesus Christ, that God became man, came to this world, lived a perfect life, became the perfect sacrifice, and died in our place upon that cross, and took upon himself our sins, and suffered our hell, to set us free from judgment, to set us free from damnation, to set us free. That's what he did. And we sit here today as part of his church, we're free Free to make our choices, free to live the lives that he would have us to live. Letting him live within us and through us, bringing honor and glory to his Father. Preservation and illumination, I think, are two very, very important ministries of any church. But may I suggest to you, it has to be the ministry of our church. Why? Because the Bible says so. You are the salt. You are the light of the world. Those aren't just suggestions. He's telling you what you are. And so the question is, are you an instrument of preservation? Are you helping people go from death unto life? And number two, do you shine bright for the world to see? You know, many times you can work in a place of business for years and years and years, and people never know that you're a Christian. Has that ever happened to you? A lot of times you don't want to tell people you're a Christian because it doesn't flow very well when people find out who you are. But then again, that's what we are. It's a choice that we made. There again, the idea of choice. I made a choice to follow Jesus no matter what comes. Life, death, health, unhealth, whatever it is. I've decided to follow Jesus. There's no turning back in my life. There's no turning back in any child of God's life. And so he says that you are the salt of the earth. So let's look at this idea of preservation just for a minute. What does it mean to be the salt of the earth? Well, if you go back to what Jesus is speaking here, he's talking to his disciples, he's talking to all these people that have gathered on the hillside to listen to his sermon, and he says that you're the salt of the earth. They understood exactly what he was talking about, especially these fishermen would have understood because these were commercial fishermen. You know, they would go on a sea of Galilee, they would fish all night, they would come in with their catch, and what did they do? They eat it themselves? No, they would take the fish, they would go ahead and take salt and rub it onto the fish, and rub it all over the fish, and, and, and pack the fish in the salt so they could take it from the Sea of Galilee to Capernaum where they could be sold. That's how they made their livelihood. But if they didn't use the salt with the heat of the day in that region, when the, salt got, when the, salt, when the fish got to Capernaum, they wouldn't be very good. Decay would have set in. And so salt was rubbed in to the fish to keep them preserved till they got to market. That's what fish did. That's what salt did. Salt was important. Salt was important. But the salt that they had wasn't like the salt that we have. You know, when you go to the kitchen and you get your salt shaker, you pour out sodium chloride. It's pretty much pure. But their salt wasn't like ours. Their salt was made up of different minerals, different other things, much including the salt. And when a good rain would happen... You know, where they had their salt piled, the rain would come and wash out the sodium chloride out of the pile of minerals and things that they had, and it would be absolutely no good for preserving anything. And how would they know if it wasn't any good? Well, they would take some in their hand and they would taste it. You know, you've tasted salt. How many of you put salt on your food? Or I should say, how many of you would like to put salt on your food? That's a different story, isn't it? And so you would taste it, and it would taste salty, right? And then, you know, it's good. But if you tasted it and it lost its flavor... What was it good for? Could they use it to pack the fish in and take it to market? Of course not. It was useless. The Bible is trying to tell us something here, that you and I are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? You can't season it again. Once it's gone, it's gone. It is then good for what? That's in your Bible. Good for nothing. It's good for nothing but to be thrown down and trampled under the foot of men. Now, God has entrusted you and I with the gospel. Amen? The marvelous words that bring life to the dead. Think of the power that we possess. Think about the authority that we have. Think about the responsibility that we have because we stand in Christ's stead. He's not here, but we are because we're the light of the world, which we'll talk about in a minute. And so we're here to, to show people Jesus. 
And so we don't want them to take the church. We don't want them to take the gospel and throw it out as an unclean thing just to be trampled on because it's important because it brings life to the dead. Now, the question I have for you here this morning is, as a church, Daniels, are you a preserving instrument? Do people see Christ in you? Do you share the gospel? Or has it lost its flavor for you? You know what I mean? There was a time when you were saved and you were excited about the Bible. You couldn't get enough of the stories. You couldn't get enough of the different books to tell you about all the different things that the Bible talked about. Are you that way today? Have you lost a little step in your dance for the Lord? Does he mean as much now as he did 20 years ago, 30 years ago? Or are we just sitting in our seats waiting for Jesus to come? Ah, sometimes we have to be careful of that, don't we? Because we all get there sometimes. He's going to come in any moment. But in the meantime, we need to be what? Busy. We need to be busy. And so God has called us as individuals, and God has called us as a church to be the salt of the earth, to be preservers of the truth that he's entrusted to us. But he goes on to say that you are the light of the world in verse 14. Illumination. How bright do you shine? You've been in coal mines, perhaps. I know that uh, John took me in a coal mine after I was here a few years, and it was interesting because when you turn off all the lights, it's pretty dark in that hole, isn't it, John? There's no light at all. You want to talk about darkness, that's dark. And I think the only time that you'll get to see that darkness is when they put you in the grave, but unfortunately you won't be able to see the darkness because you won't be around. You can laugh at that because that was almost a joke, but the idea there is that you're, gonna, you're not there anymore, right? You're not in the ground, you're in heaven. And so the child of God, there is no darkness. But to see it in the physical world is an interesting thing because here, Jesus is talking about us, his children, his people, being the light of the world. Well, how are we the light of the world? Let's look at a couple thoughts about this. First of all, I want you to see the, the prominence of the light. The prominence of the light. When you are a bright light that can light up the darkness, you do not take it and shove it someplace where it can't be seen. As a child of God, God has entrusted to you certain things that he expects from you to think about what you should be doing. And so it, you cannot be a Christian and be a Christian in secret. That's what he's talking about here. It says that you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hillside cannot be hidden. People should see Jesus in you 24-7. When you walk into your place of business, they know who you are because you radiate it through the Holy Spirit that controls your life. And not just that, you radiate it through the words that you speak. You don't walk in fear, you walk in boldness of the Spirit of God that controls you, that lives within you. And so it says very plainly here, a city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. You can't hide. As a child of God, there is no secretness to who we are. We're to announce it boldly from the mountaintops who we are, who we represent, <clears throat> and what we've been called to do. And so we have the prominence of the light. You don't stick it, it says in verse 15. You don't put it under a basket so it does nothing. But you put it on a lampstand. You put it on a lampstand so it has a prominence to light the darkness. And that's been entrusted to you and me. You know, we live here at Daniels. We live in Beaver, where we happen to live at, up and down this little road here. And there's a lot of lost people, would you say, in our area? You know, walk into Kroger's, and you wonder how many of those people are really saved. You wonder how many of those Christians who are in Kroger's are really living what I'm talking about today. Because what I'm talking about today isn't anything special. It's the normalcy of who we are as children of God. This is expected of us. That's what Jesus is saying. And so put your light on top of everything where people can see it. That's the prominence of the light that we've been called to be. And the purpose is found there in verse 15, the last part. It gives light to all who are in the house. Isn't that cool? You, as the light of the world, are to set your light so people can see it, so you can give light. You know, back in Bible times, they would have little oil lamps, or they would have candles, and you would stand there with an oil lamp, you'd stand there with a candle, and it would just kind of shine right around you. The higher you lift it up, the more light that it gave to that room that you were in. Let me give you another thought. That's great to hold it up, but you know when you walk? With that light, you can cover much more space and bring much more light to the darkness. And that's just one individual doing that. Imagine now if a whole church did that. 
Wouldn't that be exciting to see that happen? And so we have the purpose of the church is to give light to the darkness. But you have to be careful. You have to be careful. Look at verse 15 again. And we see the perversion of the light. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a, a basket. You know, sometimes I think that's where we are as Christian people. We come to church on Sunday and we celebrate Jesus. And we think about him during the week, especially if somebody's sick or something like that. But do you worship him every day? Not just to think about him, but to worship him and praise him for all that he's given to you. The greatness that he is, the life that he's imparted to you, the sacrifice that he's made for you and for me. You know, don't hide the truth, live the truth. But sometimes we can pervert the idea of the light because we want to hide it. Man, let's never hide the light of Christ. He says, while I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. But then he says here that, hey, guess what? You're the light of the world. Let your light shine. Don't hide it. Let people see it. Because that, my friends, can transform people's lives. And you, you have the opportunity to be used of God to bring light into people's darkness. Isn't that exciting to think about? Kathy, I think it's great just to think about what God can do with me. I mean, I know I'm nobody. I can't even talk right half the time. But God chose me. God called me. And we just do it. And so if God can use me, God can use anybody. For his glory. And he tells us here certain things that are true. We are the preservation of this dark world through the gospel. And number two, we've been called to illumine this world with the light that we have through the gospel. And so we have the prominence of the light, the purpose of the light, the perversion of light, and there's one more, and that's the praise. The praise. Look at verse 16. Let your light so shine before men. Is your light shining? How bright is it shining? Is that on a lampstand, or have you put it under a bushel basket? Do people see it? Do people see Christ in you? A couple things I want you to see here. It said, let your light so shine before men. Why? Why should I do that? It tells us that they may see your good works. Of course, good works don't save you. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10 tells us that. For by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. We're not saved by works. Then it says, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. So it depends on which side of salvation you talk about works. On the front side, works don't help you. But on the back side, they should be there. If you have true faith in Christ, you have works that go with the true faith that God has given to us. James said faith without works is what? Dead faith. No good at all. And so think about the idea here that because we are the light of the world, we are to work. Because the world's in darkness, and God has entrusted us with his light. And I don't know about you, but here in America, things aren't too bright. I mean, we're seeing things that we've never seen before. Sin running rampant. Abortion up until the day of the child being born is unfathomable to my mind. Murders and rapes and robberies are all on an increase. We are living in a godless, lawless society. And God has placed you here for a purpose and placed you here for a reason. Use the works that he's given and trusted to you, the works of the gospel to preserve and the light to bring people out of darkness into that light. And so it's works. And there should be works in all of our lives as God's people. Amen, Joe? Works not for salvation, but works that come after salvation because of who we are. And so there should be praise in our lips for the works that he's given to us. And it says, and glorify your Father in heaven. And so I love what it says. Let your light so shine before men, one, that they may see your good works, praise God, they see Jesus in me, and glorify your Father in heaven. That's what it's all about, isn't it? We need to see our Father in heaven. When we see our Father in heaven, you will be the salt of the earth, and you will be that illumination I've been talking about, because when you have a glimpse of God, it transforms you. But sometimes, sometimes as God's people, we have a tendency to, to sit back and just to enjoy what we have and who we are instead of the works that he's entrusted us with. My life is short. Some of yours will be longer. You know, I'm 62. Some of you are a lot younger than me. What a blessing that is. You know, I always thought about my son. He got saved when he was five years old, and now he's in the ministry himself. And I looked at all the years that I wasted because nobody really ever took me aside and talked to me about Jesus. 
talk to me about what I needed to do and why I needed to do it. I look at all the wasted years I could have had, things I could have learned that are gone from my opportunities now. And so you, we can't get those back, can we? What's done is done, but we can live from the present. Amen? And so two things I want you to remember as we continue our thinking here this morning. And that is, number one, you have been called and the church has been called to preservation. We are to take the gospel and rub it in to this dead world to preserve it, to give it hope, to give it life. And you've been called to illumine this darkness with the light that God has entrusted to you. Illumination and preservation are words that should think on your mind all day today. Are you who God has called you to be? Now, having said all that, I promise you today that we're going to be looking at some areas in our church that we need to focus on with these two aspects. And for the last couple of years, and the deacons and trustees can tell you, anybody who's had taken any time to sit down and talk with, my, with me to see my thinking and how I'm going with different things would understand that I have a heart for lost people. I want to see people saved. I don't know if you noticed, but many of my sermons are geared to the idea that we ought to be going out doing what? Evangelizing, telling people about Jesus, being the light of the world, being the preservation power that God has entrusted us with. Because of who we are. And so it, it doesn't escape my thinking to realize that this is who we are. This is what God has called us to be. And God has called me to be the, the guidance counselor of the church, in a, in a way, to, to lead them in the right direction, to be the shepherd of the sheep. Sheep make sheep, not the shepherd. I'm not saying that the pastor doesn't have the opportunity to go out and witness, because he sure does, and he sure should. That's what we do as Christians, amen? Because technically we're all sheep. But God has given each of us different gifts to use for his glory. And so we have now the idea of what would God call Daniel's missionary Baptist to do? And this is what I want you to think about. For the last couple of years, I've noticed that we, we need young people. And so I think what we need to do as a church is to take our focus all together, in a sense, all together off broad missions and focus them on home. And the idea that we need to focus our attention on young people, young ministries, because that's the future of the church. Would not you agree with that? Children's ministry needs to be a priority of our church. And it really isn't. It hasn't been. You know, our Sunday schools aren't very well attended by even members of the church with their kids. We need to increase that and change that. So we need to focus on our young people. Well, that's easier said than done. You know, we there for a while, Kevin, we had Awana. But the problem with Awana was our culture has changed so much. It wasn't that we weren't doing the things that we needed to do, but the culture has changed. And one of the ways that it was changing, the people who were working with Awana were upset because the kids weren't learning their verses, they weren't participating hardly, and they just show up. And that would be it. They weren't interested that much in the things of God. So we need to kind of change that and work that and see what we can come up with. It. Maybe we can change it. Maybe we can change it. But we can do one thing, and we can focus on that one thing, and that's to try to change it. Nothing ventured. Let me tell you what the rest of it is. Nothing gained. There you go. And so my heart's desire is, is, is to, to see our, our young people's program begin to blossom. And to do that, it's going to take all of us older people to make that take place. You and I need to pray about that. You and I need to go out and shake the bushes for kids and maybe bring them to the, the programs that we're going to be having that Kevin is, is starting to do this year. To focus our attention on getting out and bringing light to these young people that need it because they live in a culture that doesn't bring them any light. It brings them darkness. And that's why the suicide rate for young people is so high today because they grow up in a world that has no hope whatsoever. Why am I here? They don't know, but we can tell them because we know the answer to that truth. So how are we going to do this? Well, they realize that the church only has limited resources to work from. Is that not true? I mean, that's just how it is. I think what we need to do is to bring on a youth pastor here at the church. That was talked recently. I've talked about it a couple years ago. It was brought up at a trustee meeting a while back, and the deacons have talked about it. And even the missions committee, we've talked about it. How do we do that? Well, what we've decided to do is to re-examine the resources that we have here at the church and to see how we can bring a, a youth pastor 
on staff without really affecting the, the resources that we have, the budget of the church. So we have to re-examine the budget of the church. And to focus our attention, yes, we're still going to have foreign missionaries. That won't change at all. But we are going to still focus our attention on local. Beloved, we have to get young people into our church. It has to be done. Or there's not going to be a church in 15, 20, 25 years. That's not just us. That's everywhere. It's just how it is. The cycles churches go through. They're born. They grow. It's just like people do. You know, you hit middle age and you get older and then you need to kind of sit back and wait till the next generation to come in. But if they don't come in, that cycle stops. And so we need to make sure that cycle continues to go. So what we're going to do is to move our youth ministries, that's the teens and also the uh, kick it ministry, to Sunday night. And what I'm asking the older people to do is to get involved in the kick it program and to get involved um, with the teen program to do things for them, to, to help them do things. And of course, if you can't do that on Sunday night, we're going to have opportunities here to be praying. Praying for what? Praying for our ministry that we have with Kick It and also with our teens. And also, on Wednesday night, there's going to be a group of our people led by our deacons going out and shaking the doors in our community, going up and down the doors, telling people about Kick It, telling people about our teens, telling people about our church, something that really hasn't been done at least in the time that I've been here and probably many years after that. Or before that. Yeah. And that takes a decision from you all. You know, they say that the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and over again. I got this from Joe. And expecting, see, I'm, I'm throwing him under the bus now, and expecting different results. It just doesn't happen. We have to become and do what God has commanded us to do. He has given us the resources that we need to do. We may have to redirect some of those, but we have everything in our, in our church to be able to do these things that I'm talking to you about. But Tim, you're talking about not having a Sunday night service. Doesn't that make us liberal? Doesn't that make that unspiritual? No, it doesn't, because we're all going to be involved in the ministries. You know, I like to see Wednesday night become an every night VBS. When VBS comes around, there is excitement in the church. Some of the older folks have spent months and months preparing all the you know, the scenery that goes with VBS, we can still do that over there. We can have monthly themes. We're only limited by our own imaginations. But you have to say, I want to be involved for Christ's sake until he comes to take me from this world to be with him. And when that happens, I want him to say, well done, Tim, you did a great job with what I gave you. You know, that's what we need to hear. And so we're going to make those changes. And I think it's important for us to do that. But to make that happen, to make all this happen, it's going to take prayer. I don't know about you, and I don't want to be negative, but we have to become a church of prayer. We have to. Wednesday night, we have Wednesday night service still when this takes place. Right, Kevin? And we're going to have Sunday morning and Sunday night service. like we are. Well, Sunday morning anyway. Sunday night we'll have prayer here. But you need to understand that prayer is important. Prayer is the heartbeat of the church, isn't it, Ken? It's what we are. You can take the temperature of the church spiritually by how many people show up for prayer meeting, how many people are really praying for the church. Some people can't. And people who can, who don't, it's just not important to them. Oh, beloved, I pray that you can make it important to yourself. So understand the power that you possess to beseech the Lord to give us fruit for our labor. Wouldn't that be marvelous to see young people coming Remember how it used to be? Um, they used to have 150 kids here sometimes. Things have changed. Culture has changed. Lots of people have different programs now, unlike what it used to be. But we've quit. Let's pick the ball back up and run with it, because Jesus hasn't come yet. Amen? So what's what we're going to be doing? We're going to be changing our thinking a little bit, focusing on home missions, but also having foreign missions as well. See, foreign missions, we just send our money to people and we expect them to do what they do. Start a church, bring people to Christ in some other country that we can't get to. But what has happened, we have fallen down a little bit in taking the message that God has entrusted to us to be home missionaries and take that message to the world. And if we can do that, if God can turn the world upside down with just a few men could he not turn this area upside down for Christ if we were just but willing to give ourselves to him, 
totally and completely for His will to be done in our life. But the question is, can we do that? Because to many people's thinking, Tim, you're asking a lot. And sometimes they won't say it, but they're, you're asking too much. You're asking too much. It's your priorities, isn't it? If your priority is Jesus, you can never be disappointed. Serving Him, glorifying Him, worshiping Him, watching young people come to Christ, watching them grow, watching them become Sunday school teachers and Bible teachers and pastors and, and pastors. Why? I mean, wonderful things. We are part of that. Doesn't that excite you? That's what we have to do. So we're going to work out this idea of creating a youth pastor's position. We'll pay him what we can. We might use the house next door to be able to give him a place to stay. We'll have to fix it up. But we can do that now. It can be done. So pray about the youth pastor position that we're going to develop here at the church. Pray for Sunday night when Kevin leads the Kick It program. Or I guess we can call it the Kick Ministry, Kids in Christ's Kingdom. They don't use balls, right, anymore, technically? Not yet. And so Kevin needs some help, for sure. And he's putting a program together. In the next week or so, he'll be able to tell you all the things that he needs to make this go. But don't wait for him to ask you. You ask him, what can I do? How can I get involved? What do you need from me? What do you need from me? How can I help? Same with the teens. Same with the teens. What can we do to make the program better? What can we do to make it exciting? How can we get more teens here? What do we need to do? Got an idea? I'm sure Scott and Stephen will listen to it. Prop it up and see if it flies. You're only limited by your own imaginations. So technically, we're not limited at all. So, Sunday night, Tim, you're not having a service. You're not speaking. I can have Bible studies anytime. We'll have some Bible studies as we talk about here in the future, too. So that won't be lacking. But, beloved, we need to become people of prayer. I can't enforce that enough. I have been in churches all my life, and we've seen this. We have programs with no purpose. Our programs have to have a purpose, and our purpose is to glorify God. Our purpose is to see people saved because God has given us the ministry of illumination. He's given us the ministry of preservation. I don't want to see any kid go to hell, do you? So you have ideas, you have thoughts, you have, we have deacons, we have me. If you have a question about this, don't go to a deacon, don't go to a trustee, you come to me. I hope in the five years I have been here, you have trusted me at least enough to know that you can follow my leadership because I don't make decisions on my own. I've talked to the deacons, I've talked to the trustees, I've talked to the missions committee, and they're all in agreement that this is the right thing to do. That's a good thing, to check out the leadership of the church. God has put them there for a purpose. So I don't agree with it. Well... It's okay. You just have to come along with us. You know? You have to agree to disagree for the glory of God. And we can do that. So I'm excited. You know, the program that Kevin's going to be happening happens on the 4th of October. Is that right or the 6th? I forget which date it is. It's the first Sunday. Ken, get your phone back out. No, it's the, it's the um, first Sunday night in October is when the kick program is going to start. It's the fourth. Thank you. So what should you be doing until then? Praying? How can I get involved? What can I do? You know, I can see that a lot of the ladies having snacks and stuff over there, just like we did at VBS. We can have some of the guys making things up so the kids can make, you know, little stools and stuff. We can teach them certain things. Make life exciting for them. It's the excitement that brings them back. We need a game, somebody to lead in games. Be involved in that. So much. So much to do if we can all do it together. And then stand back and watch what the Holy Spirit can do to a church and to a people that have given their hearts to Him. Not partially, but totally. Sometimes, I'll close with this thought, sometimes churches like ours started out small, began to grow, Started off down the road here, started over here, and now they created a little church building, and that church building wasn't big enough. They went over here, and they built the Family Life Center, and the church was having in there, and they had the desire to build a big church. And here we sit today in a big church, beautiful church, wonderful place. 
And sometimes we have a tendency just to sit back and say, look what we've done. And I'm reminded of the parable that Jesus said, you know, I've had a wonderful crop this year. I need to big, build bigger barns and store up everything in it. And Jesus says, thou fool, tonight thy life is required of thee. We work until we die. Amen? Until he calls us home. That's what it's about. So don't sit down. Don't rest. Be active. If you can't get involved, you can pray. You can become a prayer warrior for Jesus. And I expect we have some here. We just need some more to go with them. So pray with me about this. And pray with the leadership as we seek to put all these things together. And then we need to pray for the right person, the right people. Be involved. Don't be a bench setter. Be a participant. Change the life of everything. Father, we thank you tonight or this morning for the opportunity that we have to gather together. We thank you for the opportunity we have to share these things. It's always my desire is to keep the church up on what we're talking about because it's not my church. It's our church. I just use the gifts that you've given to me here. And so, Father, we've talked about some things, talked about some directions that we're seeking to go, but we need your guidance, God. We need your enlightenment of our hearts to get us all on the same page that we might press forward. This pandemic, Father, is, is hurting the church. And so in a way that we're, we're reinventing our, our direction, we're reinventing our purpose, though it really isn't reinventing. It's always been the purpose of the church. And Lord, I pray that our people would see the need that we're talking about to get our young people active in church again. Lord, we love you and we thank you for the high calling you've given to us. And now we just look forward to what you're going to do through us as we allow you to have complete control of our hearts and our lives. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I know that today's preaching was just about the future and who we are in Christ. But let me just ask you before you leave here today, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, there's no hope for you. The only way that you can have hope in this life is through Jesus. And the same with young people. They need Jesus. They need that hope that he brings that can never be taken away. And so if you're here today or you're listening to my voice and you don't know Jesus Christ as your own personal Savior, you need to call me. Or you need to talk with me before you leave here today. So I can show you from the Word of God how you can know that you're born again. How you can have victory over the fear of death because you have eternal life. Don't leave here a fool. Leave here glorifying God for all that he's given to you because he is a wonderful God. Amen? Father, we thank you as we're dismissed today. Help us to glorify you with our lives. Help us to thank you for the day that you've given to us. Help us to thank you for the health that we have. Help us to thank you for everything and in all things to thank you because you are a wonderful God. Lord, we love you and we look forward to what you're going to do as we yield to your guidance. Glorify yourself in us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You're going to be dismissed now as the ushers come. If you need to talk with me, I'll linger over here on the side or I'll find you out front. So God's good. Amen.